attention to that man behind the curtain. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The shit's chess, it ain't checkers. So I strongly suggest that you wake the f*** up. There's a battle going on right now, a battle to define everything that happens on the internet in terms of traditional things that the law understands. Is sharing a video on BitTorrent like shoplifting from a movie store? Or is it like loaning a videotape to a friend? Is reloading a web page over and over again like a peaceful virtual sit-in? Or a violent smashing of shop windows? Is the freedom to connect like freedom of speech? Or like the freedom to murder? This bill would be a huge, potentially permanent loss. If we lost the ability to communicate with each other over the internet, it would be a change to the Bill of Rights, the freedoms guaranteed in our Constitution, the freedoms our country had been built on, would be suddenly deleted. New technology, instead of bringing us greater freedom, would have snuffed out fundamental rights we'd always taken for granted. And I realized that day, talking to Peter, that I couldn't let that happen. But it was going to happen. The bill, COICA, was introduced on September 20th, 2010, a Monday. And in the press release heralding the introduction of this bill, way at the bottom, it was scheduled for a vote on September 23rd, just three days later. And while, of course, there had to be a vote, you can't pass a bill without a vote, the results of that vote were already a foregone conclusion. Because if you looked at the introduction of the law, it wasn't just introduced by one rogue, eccentric member of Congress. It was introduced by the chair of the Judiciary Committee and co-sponsored by nearly all the other members, Republicans and Democrats. So yes, there'd be a vote, but it wouldn't be much of a surprise because nearly everyone who was voting had signed their name to the bill before it was even introduced. Because nearly everyone who was voting had signed their name to the bill before it was even introduced. Now, I can't stress how unusual this is. This is emphatically not how Congress works. I'm not talking about how Congress should work, the way you see on Schoolhouse Rock. I mean, this is not the way Congress actually works. I mean, I think we all know Congress is a dead zone of deadlock and dysfunction. There are months of debates and horse trading and hearings and stall tactics. I mean, you know, first you're supposed to announce that you're going to hold hearings on a problem and then days of experts talking about the issue and then you propose a possible solution, you bring the experts back for their thoughts on that. And then other members have different solutions and they propose those and you spend a bunch of time debating and there's a bunch of trading to get members over to your cause. And finally you spend hours talking one-on-one -on -one with the different people in the debate, try and come back with some sort of compromise which you hash out in endless backroom meetings. And then when that's all done, you take that and you go through it line by line in public to see if anyone has any objections or wants to sit, make any changes. And then you have the vote. It's a painful, arduous process. You don't just introduce a bill on Monday and then pass it unanimously a couple days later. That just doesn't happen in Congress. You don't just introduce a bill on Monday and then pass it unanimously a couple days later. That just doesn't happen in Congress. But this time, it was going to happen. And it wasn't because there were no disagreements on the issue. There are always disagreements. Some senators thought the bill was much too weak and needed to be stronger. As it was introduced, the bill only allowed the government to shut down websites. And these senators, they wanted any company in the world to have the power to get a website shut down. And these senators, they wanted any company in the world to have the power to get a website shut down. Other senators thought it was a drop too strong. But somehow, and the kind of thing you never see in Washington, they'd all managed to put their personal differences aside to come together and support one bill they were persuaded they could all live with a bill that would censor the internet. And when I saw this, I realized, whoever was behind this was good. Now, the typical way you make good things happen in Washington is you find a bunch of wealthy companies who agree with you. Social security didn't get passed because some brave politicians decided their good conscience couldn't possibly let old people die starving in the streets. I mean, are you kidding me? Social Security got passed because John D. Rockefeller was sick of having to take money out of his profits to pay for his workers' pension funds. Why do that when you can just let the government take money from the workers? Now, my point is not that Social Security is a bad thing. I think it's fantastic. It's just that the way you get the government to do fantastic things is you find a big company willing to back them. 
The problem is, of course, that big companies aren't really huge fans of civil liberties. You know, it's, it's not that they're against them, it's just there's not much money in it. Now, if you've been reading the press, you probably didn't hear this part of the story. As Hollywood has been telling it, the great, good copyright bill they were pushing was stopped by the evil internet companies who make millions of dollars off of copyright infringement. But it just, it really wasn't true. I mean, I was in there, in the meetings with the internet companies, actually, probably all here today, and, you know, if all their profits depended on copyright infringement, they would have put a lot more money into changing copyright law. <laughs> the fact is, the big internet companies they would do just fine if this bill passed. I mean, they wouldn't be thrilled about it, but I doubt they would even have a noticeable dip in their stock price. So they were against it, but they were against it like the rest of us on grounds primarily of principle. And principle doesn't have a lot of money in the budget to spend on lobbyists. So they were practical about it. Look, they said, this bill is going to pass. In fact, it's probably going to pass unanimously. As much as we try, this is not a train we're going to be able to stop. So we're not going to support it. We couldn't support it, but in opposition, let's just try and make it better. So that was the strategy, lobby to make the bill better. They had lists of changes that would make the bill less obnoxious or less expensive for them or whatever, but the fact remained, at the end of the day, it was going to be a bill that was going to censor the Internet, and there was nothing we could do to stop it. So I did what you always do when you're a little guy facing a terrible future with long odds and little hope of success. I started an online petition. I mean, it was amazing. It was huge. The power of the internet rose up in force against this bill. And then it passed unanimously. Now, to be fair, several of the members gave nice speeches before casting their vote. And in their speeches, they said their office had been overwhelmed with comments about the First Amendment concerns behind this bill, comments that had them very worried. So worried, in fact, they weren't sure that they still supported the bill. But even though they didn't support it, they were going to vote for it anyway, they said, because they needed to keep the process moving, and they were sure any problems that were had with it could be fixed later. So I'm going to ask you, does this sound like Washington, D.C. to you? Since when do members of Congress vote for things that they oppose just to keep the process moving? I mean, whoever was behind this was good. And then, suddenly, the process stopped. Senator Ron Wyden, the Democrat from Oregon, put a hold on the bill, giving a speech in which he called it a nuclear bunker buster bomb aimed at the internet. He announced he would not allow it to pass without changes. And as you may know, a single senator can't actually stop a bill by themselves, but they can delay it. By objecting to a bill, they can demand Congress spend a bunch of time debating it before getting it passed, and Senator Wyden did. He bought us time. A lot of time, as it turned out, his delay held all the way through the end of that session of Congress, so that when the bill came back, it had to start all over again. And since they were starting all over again, they figured, why not give it a new name? And that's when it began being called PIPA, and eventually SOPA. I remember when this moment first hit me. I was at an event, and I was talking, and I got introduced to a U.S. senator, one of the strongest proponents of the original Koika bill, in fact. And I asked him why despite being such a progressive, despite giving a speech in favor of civil liberties, why he was supporting a bill that would censor the internet. And you know, that typical politician smile he had suddenly faded from his face, and his eyes started burning this fiery red. And he started shouting at me. He said, those people on the internet, they think they can get away with anything. They think they can just put anything up there, and there's nothing we can do to stop them. They put up everything. They, they put up our nuclear missiles, and they just laugh at us. Well, we're going to show them. There's got to be laws on the Internet. It's got to be under control. N now, as far as I know, nobody has ever put up the U.S.'s nuclear missiles on the Internet. I mean, it's not something I've heard about. But that's sort of the point. He wasn't having a rational concern. Right? It was this irrational fear that things were out of control. Here was this man, a United States senator, and those people on the internet, they were just mocking him. They had to be brought under control. Things had to be under control. And I think that was the attitude of Congress. And just as seeing that fire in that senator's eyes scared me, I think those hearings scared a lot of people. They saw this wasn't the attitude of a thoughtful government trying to resolve trade-offs in order to best represent its citizens. This was more like the attitude of a tyrant. And so the citizens fought back. 
I mean, this really was unprecedented. Don't take my word for it, but ask former Senator Chris Dodd, now the chief lobbyist for Hollywood. He admitted, after he lost, that he had masterminded the whole evil plan. And he told the New York Times he'd never seen anything like it during his many years in Congress. And everyone I've spoken to agrees. The people rose up and they caused a sea change in Washington. Not the press, which refused to cover the story. Just coincidentally, their parent companies all happened to be lobbying for the bill. Not the politicians, who were pretty much unanimously in favor of it. And not the companies who had all but given up trying to stop it and decided it was inevitable. It was really stopped by the people. The people themselves. They killed the bill dead. So dead that when members of Congress propose something now that even touches the internet, they have to give a long speech beforehand about how it is definitely not like SOPA. So dead that when you ask congressional staffers about it, they groan and shake their heads like it's all a bad dream they're trying really hard to forget. So dead that it's kind of hard to believe this story. Hard to remember how close it all came to actually passing. Hard to remember how this could have gone any other way. But it wasn't a dream or a nightmare. It was all very real. And it will happen again. Sure, it will have yet another name, and maybe a different excuse, and probably do its damage in a different way. But make no mistake, the enemies of the freedom to connect have not disappeared. The fire in those politicians' eyes hasn't been put out. There are a lot of people, a lot of powerful people, who want to clamp down on the internet. And to be honest, there aren't a whole lot who have a vested interest in protecting it from all of that. Even some of the biggest companies, some of the biggest internet companies, to put it frankly, would benefit from a world in which their little competitors could get censored. We can't let that happen. What do you want us to do? Say hell no, motherfuckers! But you could sleep when you're dead. Right now, 